What's happening? Thanks for joining me as always. It is much appreciated on this Thursday. Nick Cattle Show with you. We will get to the Red Sox later on in this podcast because, of course, it's opening night out in Seattle. But first, we start with Jaden Daniels. Daniels had his pro day yesterday. The Patriots had roughly 50 people there to watch this pro day. And uh, did we learn anything new about Daniels? Did this move the needle in any significant way for the Patriots? You know, pro days are the next step in the process. They're not the final step. They're not the most important step, but they are the next step as we get ready, as we get ready for the NFL draft a month from tonight. That's right. A month from tonight, we will be sitting down, watching and waiting to see what the Patriots actually do with that third pick, unless they trade it beforehand. But back to the pro day. Next step in the process, most important part, of course, is the film. What does the film tell you? What's left? You still have interviews to go through. These guys get up the whiteboard, all of these kinds of things when they go to Gillette Stadium for their top 30 visits. You have Zoom meetings. So there's still a good amount of information that needs to be gathered by the Patriots before they make this pick. But yesterday for Jaden Daniels was that next step. Now, he didn't go through the workouts. He didn't run the 40. He didn't do any of those kinds of things, but he did get measured and he did throw the football. Now, the measurement was one of the most important factors of Jaden Daniels in what he would prove, quote-unquote, to teams during his pro day. And Jaden Daniels ended up being six foot three plus, six foot three plus, 210 pounds. So he weighed in at 210 pounds. Now, the first question I have, how accurate is that? How accurate is the weight? LSU tells... These teams, it's it's 210. NFL teams start to leak that to the media. Was it 210? Was it 207? Was it 205? Was it 215? Let's just say it was 210. Let's say it was accurate. What's interesting about that is Daniels didn't weigh in at the combine. And the thought process was that Daniels didn't weigh in at the combine because he was going to take those extra few weeks to eat as much as he possibly could to fill up on the carbs, baby, and to put on as much weight as possible before the pro day so he would weigh in at his heaviest. Now, what's interesting about the 210 mark, that's what Daniels was listed at at LSU. So if you were looking for any kind of weight gain, you didn't really get it. Daniels was listed at 210. Yesterday, he weighed in at 210. Now, that begs the question. If he's weighing in at 210 after eating for the last few weeks, then what did he really play at? NFL teams were concerned that he was going to be hovering around 200 pounds. Jaden Daniels, when he went to Arizona State, when he first got there, I mean, this dude was crazy thin, like 170, 175. So the, the question that the NFL teams, including the Patriots, have to answer, what is Daniels playing weight? He weighed in at 210, but that was after a few weeks. So what was he playing at? When he was playing at LSU, was it 195? Was it 200? Was it 210? Was it two? What was that weight? So that's one of the biggest questions that have to be answered. I see people running around and saying, oh, well, he weighed in at 210. That's a good number. That's not going to be his playing weight, folks. He's going to play. He's going to sweat. He's going to lose weight. He weighs in at 210 on March 27th. I could pretty much guarantee you that he's not going to weigh in at 210 on October 27th. So what is his playing weight? If he's hovering around 200 pounds or less, that could be a big time issue. Could be a big time issue. What's the playing weight? The $1 million question for any team. If you're the Patriots, as a Patriots fan, you're sitting there and you're watching, you're trying to figure out what Jaden Daniels is, what he can be. The million dollar question is, what will Jaden Daniels be able to do with his frame at the NFL level? Will he be able to put weight on the frame? He's a very tall guy. Again, he's six foot three and change. He's got a long torso. His legs are not as long as you would expect from somebody who's six foot three plus. But how much weight can he put on the frame? 
Can he put another five to 10 pounds on the frame? If you think he can get up to 215, 220, then his playing weight drops down to about 205 to 210. Then that's a little bit more understandable. So do these teams, do they believe that their nutrition program, that their weight training program, do they believe that they can stack the pounds on top of Jaden Daniels? Do they think they can put another five to 10 pounds on his frame? Now, people might say the frame doesn't matter. I disagree, and it has to do with how Daniels plays, his style of play, which we'll get into in a minute. I think it is a legitimate question to ask about this specific player because how he approaches the game. All right, before we move on, don't forget to like and subscribe. Every thumb means the world to us. Uh, and again, we're trying to build this community, so just take a second of your time as you watch here on YouTube and make sure you flash that thumbs up button for us and get notified, subscribe, trying to hit 3,000 subscriptions by April 8th. We're about 250 away from that mark. Let's continue to push Spotify, Apple Pods, rate and review. Before I get to the style of play and whether or not Daniels truly changed any minds yesterday with his pro day, let's uh, jump to a super chat from Vitalix. Thank you, Vitalix, with the $10 super chat. What would your reaction be if the Patriots drafted J.J. McCarthy? He's being mocked second and third now with May dropping. Personally, I would go into hibernation for a bit. I'm still a May guy at three. Love the show, Nick. Vitalix, thank you. I appreciate the super chat. J.J. McCarthy to me is a starting NFL quarterback. The question with McCarthy is how high is the ceiling? Do you believe McCarthy could be the guy who could be a stud? If you believe that J.J. McCarthy could end up being that kind of stud quarterback two, three years down the road, we're talking about somebody who could be a top five to eight guy. That's who you draft at number three. It, it, like if you believe that he can be, you know, a, a level not necessarily at special, but maybe slightly lower than special. If, if you think he can be in that conversation of top five to 10 quarterbacks in the league, then you take him at three. And I wouldn't have an issue if you think that. I don't think that with McCarthy. Now, maybe I'll be surprised. I have been wrong before. I will be wrong again. If I was never wrong doing this, I would not be doing this. I would be on some island making a billion dollars a year gambling the Chicago. So I could be wrong. But when I look at McCarthy, I see him as a good NFL quarterback, but not necessarily that guy that can be the driving force of the football team. When I look at Drake May, I look at the elite traits, the top-end traits that Drake May has, and I say to myself, that guy has the potential to grow into a top five to eight quarterback if you handle him correctly. So that's how I feel. Right now, right now I would say on March 28th that Drake May would be my guy at three if he's there. That's what I would say. But again, I appreciate the super chat. All right, I don't think what happened yesterday with Jaden Daniels is going to change too many minds. I think a lot of people expected him to weigh around 210 because that was his listed weight. He took the extra few weeks, and I don't think that is going to surprise anybody. I don't think that really changes much of the math, right? I don't think it changes much of the math. Now, the question is the frame and the style of play. Because Daniels is not a guy who's going to sit in the pocket and pick teams apart. He can throw from the pocket. He does a pretty decent job at it, not as much in the middle of the field. And sometimes he's a little bit slow in processing, but he's still a good passer of the football. The question is the style of play, and is Daniels going to be able to survive in the NFL, when you're going against guys who are 220, 230, 240 defensive linemen, guys that fly around the field a lot faster than you see at the college level. And it really tells us everything we need to know because of Brian Kelly and what he said yesterday. Evan Lazar had this. Brian Kelly was asked what the number one question from teams was uh, uh, regarding Daniels. And Kelly said that the number one question pertain to Daniel's durability and his reckless running style. Daniel's doesn't get down. He tends to take big hits. 
And if you are going to draft somebody at three, you want that guy to be durable. Now, of course, injuries can happen to anybody. You have no idea what's going to happen. Freak injuries happen. Significant injuries happen out of nowhere. Okay, We can all understand that and acknowledge it. However, the risk is higher when the guy's frame isn't as big. He's not as thick. And if he runs around like a chicken with his head cut off at times and takes big shots. And Jaden Daniels runs around like a chicken with his head cut off at times and takes big shots. So if we're talking about somebody who's going from the SEC to the NFL and he's having to take more pounding and he's going to be running around taking that pounding, a, a, a significant question for anybody who's entertaining using a top pick on Jaden Daniels is whether or not he's going to be able to survive long term. Is he going to get dragged eventually by all of these hits? Is it going to wear him down if he plays at 195, if he plays at 200 pounds, taking these shots from NFL linebackers and safeties coming downhill? How is that going to impact him? And Brian Kelly, again, said the number one question that was asked of him yesterday at the Pro Day was, quote, will he slide? He joked about that when asked about the NFL team's concerns with Daniels at the next level. Kelly said questions seldom steer toward Daniel's ability to make throws or process defenses. Instead, it's all about self-preservation and weighing in at 210 will help quell some concerns. Well, that's if you believe he plays at 210. He might start at 210, but where's he play at? Uh, they're legitimate concerns to me. They are. They are legitimate concerns with Jaden Daniels and his size and his playing style and the fact that he does not like to slide, he doesn't like to get down, he doesn't like to get out of bounds. And I, I would have a, a legit fear of Daniels getting hurt early on in his NFL career because he decides to try to take off and he gets smacked. Now, I know a lot of people will say, man, he's really fast. He is really fast. And Brian Kelly had said yesterday he thought if Daniels ran the 40, he would have ran in the four threes elite athleticism. However, NFL defenses have elite athleticism. NFL defenses are different than the SEC. So I, I do think those concerns about the frame, they're credible. All right, let's jump to a super chat from Zach. $5 super chat. Thank you, Zach. And of course, $5 from this super chat. Don't forget, you can pay five bucks for the Patreon. You can check out the Patreon page on my channel, patreon.com slash Nick Cattle, C-A-T-T-L-E-S. Five bucks a month for the Patreon. Exclusive content starting next week. Every podcast that we do ad-free on that page. Also, an exclusive podcast every week to go along with a Q&A. Mailbag, we'll be doing playoff post-game conversations over there as well. Live streams about the Celtics and the Bruins. Zach, who cares if we use number three on a QB and suck? We use the pick next year like the Bengals did for Chase or trade down and build like many want this year. So this is, you know, the, the, the question that has been brought up an awful lot here over the past few months, and I think we're going to continue to have this question over the next few weeks until the draft is actually done, and I wouldn't be surprised if this question continues to be asked even after the draft. Do you go with the quarterback first or the ensemble first, so to speak? I am a big believer, and I have stood by this, and I will continue to stand by this, being consistent. I am a big believer, Zach, that if you have a quarterback that you believe can be generational or top five to seven in the NFL, if you have an opportunity to draft a quarterback like that, you draft a quarterback like that. You don't mess around because you have no guarantee who's going to be out there next year, two years, three years from now. You have no guarantee that you will ever have the opportunity to land somebody that can significantly and somewhat single-handedly change the projection of your franchise like a top-notch quarterback can. So I'm a big believer in drafting that quarterback if they believe he can be that guy. I think Drake May can be a top five to eight quarterback in the NFL. So if you asked me, would I draft May at three or would I look to try to add pieces first and then go get the quarterback? I would draft Drake May. Because I just feel like 
he has those high level, high end traits. And if he fixes some of the things that are more than fixable footwork, some of the mechanics, if he fixes those things, then he gives you that level of play in nothing. And I mean, absolutely nothing in the NFL can replace having that level of play at quarterback. The 49ers built their team better than anybody could build a team. Defensively, offensively, tons of weapons. And they have yet to win a Super Bowl. They might get there if Brock Purdy continues to improve and ends up being even better than he was this year. But the reason why the Niners haven't won a Super Bowl is because their quarterback wasn't capable of taking advantage of opportunities that were in front of him That would have allowed them to win the Super Bowl. The Chiefs played like dog crap offensively in the Super Bowl for three quarters. How did they come back? They came back because Brock Purdy wasn't able to level up and score more points for his offense. And he made some some bad decisions and missed some throws. And so you have a, a much, much smaller margin for error if you go with the Niners plan. When you have a Patrick Mahomes, when you have a Joe Burrow, when you have a a Josh Allen even at times, when you have a quarterback who's top five to seven, you have much more room to screw up as a football team. You can have a bad quarter. You can have a bad two quarters. You can even have a bad three quarters, but you can still have a chance to win that football game because you believe in that guy in the huddle and he can bring you back. You don't believe that with, you know, an average quarterback or slightly above average quarterback. Appreciate the super chat, uh, Zach. Really appreciate that. All right, so the one thing that did surprise me about Daniels yesterday, a little bit more zip than I anticipated. Now, he's a very good thrower of the football downfield, but a lot of times he kind of puts loft under it, and he, of course, had Brian Thomas Jr., and he had you know Malik Neighbors, two guys who can burn and get downfield, stretch it vertically. So I wanted to see how well Daniels threw the football middle of the field, 15, 20, 25 yards. That's what I wanted to see. And I thought he had more zip. I thought he had more zip yesterday than I thought he would have. Now he did have some inaccuracies, you know, five footballs hit the ground and some might say five footballs. Yeah. During a pro day, that's a pretty high number. He missed a couple of throws downfield He missed a couple of throws on the outside. Some of that could have been chemistry, but he did miss some throws. Evan Lazar on the throw of the day, Patriots.com. The throw from Daniel's session that made me say, wow, was on a corner post route. He rolled to his right, put the ball perfectly on the sideline, roughly 40 yards downfield. It wasn't the pro day throw where he rolls to his left and throws back right, but it was still one of those passes that produced an audible sound. So there were a few dimes from Daniels, and you would expect that, a guy who is expected to go in the top three. So when I look at the big picture, if you're the Patriots, I don't think yesterday changed much of your opinion on Jaden Daniels. Other than slightly more zip. Weighing in at 210, that was his listed weight. His release, his mechanics, we all knew that was there. The ability to throw downfield, we all knew that was there. So, you know, you you have pretty much the book on Jaden Daniels. The hands, if you're wondering, nine and three eighths. Good hand size. <laughs> the hand size is fine. But I don't think much changed yesterday. And if you asked me, would I draft, would I draft Jaden Daniels at three? If Caleb Williams and Drake may were gone off the board, I would. As long as the personality checks out. And there were some questions about Daniel's ability to lead at Arizona State. Now, yesterday he was showing everybody that he loves his teammates and, you know, how much of that is theatrical. Not really sure. But as long as he personally checks out, I would be fine with the Patriots drafting Jaden Daniels at three. I would because he has some elite traits. You know, the elite traits, the athleticism is elite. There's no doubt about that. Lamar Jackson-esque. Michael Vick-esque. Randall Cunningham-esque. Steve Young, better than Steve Young. But the ability to move, better than Josh Allen. 
So the elite athleticism is a high-end trait. The deep ball touch and ball placement is a high-end trait. He's a confident young man. He's had plenty of experience. He has started more games at the collegiate level than anybody that's going to be there in the top four or five. He's had many more starts than J.J. McCarthy and Drake May. He's had more starts than Caleb Williams, so he's an experienced guy. He's going to play day one for you. Doesn't mean he's flawless day one, but he's going to play day one for you. He has enough arm. He produced in the SEC. So I would say, yes, Jaden Daniels, to me, fine. I would be fine with that pick at three. All right, don't forget to give us that thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Trying to hit 3,000 subscriptions by April 8th. We're a couple of weeks away. It's going to take a big push. We're 250 or so subscribers away from that goal. It's going to take a big push from all of you. If you like what we do, give us that thumbs up and subscribe. Don't forget to comment as well. Rate and review on Spotify and Apple Pods. And if you're at Spotify and Apple Pods, you can always swing on by the YouTube channel. Give us that thumbs up, video on demand, and also subscribe. Ken's, Pat's Talk, Super Chat. What's up, Nick? What's up, Ken? Big day for you down there in North Kakalaka. When do you think we will start hearing what way we are leaning at three? Thanks for coming on my podcast. Um, You're welcome. I enjoyed it, Ken. I appreciate you, my man. Always appreciate people that are going through the grind and want to do what I do and, and want to do it for the love of it. So no issue, no worries whatsoever. I enjoyed my time sitting talking football with you going back uh, several weeks ago. I, I think we'll get closer to they're leaning towards it. And by the way, Ken, you didn't have to pay the $5 super chat to correct your thanks, but I appreciate it, my man. I very much appreciate it. So I, I think we'll start, I think we'll start seeing reports over the weekend about, you know, how the Patriots felt following the pro days. And when we get to about one to two weeks before the draft. So I, I think we're still a couple of weeks away until we start to get a little bit more serious regarding where the Patriots are leaning, how their board might stack up. But I th- I do think over the next couple of days, we will hear about the reaction regarding uh, the, the Jaden Daniels pro day and the Drake May pro day uh, and, and, and those kinds of things. I will say that the Patriots, I said this last week, you know, are they out on Michael Penix? I don't know if they're out on Michael Penix. Some of their actions would tell you. They did not send a big contingent to Washington. However, as expected, they did send some people out to Washington to watch Penix today. They've got uh, Cam Williams out there. Uh, he he leads scouting department. So, uh, you know, you'll have Cam Williams out there along with, I think it was three or four scouts, Burt Breer tweeted. So they will have a smaller contingent at Michael Penix's pro day. So they're still keeping an eye on Penix, which makes all the sense in the world. I don't think they're especially sold on Penix but they will have people out there watching him today. But I I think, Ken, to get back to your question, we'll get more info as the time goes on over the next couple of weeks. But I think the next couple of days we'll get a feel for how guys, you know, looked at the pro days, how they felt about the pro days. And then with about a week or two left before the draft, we'll start to really get some information, some some real tangible information. Uh, And we'll also get even more leaks, which makes it messy. Smokescreen season, baby. All right. We all know Wolf's decision. This is going to be Wolf's decision, right? We think it is. I expect Jonathan Kraft, Robert Kraft to have a say in the room. It's the third pick overall. It's the quarterback. It's the franchise. It's the face of that franchise. I think we'd all be, you know, ignorant to reality to believe that the Crafts won't be in the room, won't have a conversation, won't be involved. They will be involved. But if we take them at their word and if we take the reporting to its word, Elliot Wolf is going to make this decision. However, I do have a question. I was thinking about this last night, and I, I want to know how you guys and gals feel. It's going to be a collaborative process. And, you know, Andrew Callahan and Doug Kide at the uh, Herald wrote this. It jumped out at me. The team has preached a collaborative approach all offseason. While talking about quarterback prospects, Mayo referenced something Alonzo Highsmith told him, quote, he's been doing it for a long time, and he said all the bad picks that he's seen, it's really been where everyone wasn't on the same page, and you would hope 
that you could get everyone on the same page, coaches and also scouts. So Mayo earlier this week, Mayo earlier this week said that Alonzo Highsmith told him the biggest mistakes that I have seen in a draft room, the biggest mistakes during a draft, during my long career, the biggest mistakes happened when everybody wasn't on the same page. So the Patriots want to have this collaborative effort. Highsmith says bad things happen when not all of us agree on something. That stood out to Mayo. So Mayo certainly wants everybody to be on the same page at number three, which begs the question, is it possible to have everybody on the same page? And I ask that because there were a million people. There were a million people at the pro day yesterday for Jaden Daniels. And there will be a million people today at Drake May's pro day. Burt Breer posted the Patriots had nine guys. They had nine guys at Jaden Daniels pro day. I mean, they took the town of Foxborough. They, they, they left me out, but they gathered everybody else in Foxborough and flew down to LSU's pro day. They had nine guys there. Who was there? Wolf was there. Mayo was there. Matt Groh, Pat Stewart, Highsmith, Cam Williams. So he, Cam Williams, will be at Washington's Pro Day, so you can remove him from today's contingent. Alex Van Pelt, Ben McAdoo, T.C. McCartney. I'm wondering why I wasn't invited. Like, there were a lot of dudes at the Pro Day yesterday, which means lots of cooks in the kitchen. And the more cooks in the kitchen, the more messy it could get. Now let's go over the pros, because there are some pros when you work collaboratively and when you have the number of cooks as the Patriots had yesterday at the pro day, you will have a lively debate. When you have nine, 10 people in the room, you will have a lively debate about certain aspects of every single prospect that comes across the board. Doesn't mean that everybody will agree or disagree. It just means there are certain, you know, aspects of a guy's game where, Hey, I am concerned about that. Somebody else in the room isn't concerned about that. For example, Jaden Daniels. Somebody in that room might say, I'm very concerned about his 210-pound frame. I think he's going to lose weight. That could be an issue, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody else in that room can say, I'm not worried about the frame because I think we can pack on another 5 to 10 pounds. He's a taller guy. We can work with it, right? So that debate, I think, is healthy. It is healthy to have a debate in the room about every prospect because you want to turn over every stone. What do we know about this guy? What don't we know about this guy? What do we think we need to know about this guy? All of those conversations, the more people in the room, the more gets unearthed. The more questions should be answered. The pros also, when you have 9, 10 guys weighing in on this, you can dissuade Elliot Wolf from having tunnel vision. And by the reports and by what some people have said, there was a feeling in the building, whether it was accurate or not, there was a feeling in that building that when Bill Belichick was running the operation, it was very tunnel vision. And it got more tunnel visioned as time went on. And it became Bill's way or the highway when drafting players. And the golden example that everybody points to is a Nikhil Harry. Now, when you have a number of voices in the room and you have that debate going back and forth, it's much tougher for the person who's leading the front office to stand up and say, this is what we're doing. And he marches out and leaves. Now, he can do that. But the idea of having a collaborative effort is to try to take away One person, one mind, one vision, one opinion, one pick. That's the idea. Now, there are also cons. Don't forget to give us that like. Give us that like while you listen and you watch. You guys have that conversation in the chat to my side. Continue to give us that thumbs up means the world to me. There are some cons to a collaborative effort. Can you get to a consensus? I Smith says that the the biggest mistakes that he has seen in a draft room is when not everybody can agree. Well, do you have 
too much dissension in the room because you have too many voices in the room. It's very difficult to get a group of eight to 10 people to agree on something. Very difficult. If the circle is three or four people, much easier. So is it possible for the Patriots to get a full consensus on any of these players at the top of the board? If they're looking at Drake May, are all 10 guys, are all 10 guys in that room going to say, yes, Drake May is the guy? If so, then you're like, okay, then there's no doubt. This is a home run pick. We're doing it. This is this is what the decision is. But it's more difficult to come to a consensus with the more people that you allow in that room. I think that it is a fascinating angle to all of this. Different thoughts, different minds, different people, different voices. Can they come to a consensus? Will Elliot Wolf stray? Right? I mean, will he stray from the pack? Will it be too much noise? And he says, you know what? My my brain's about to implode. I am done. Thanks for the information, guys. I, I appreciate your opinions. But this is how I feel, and, and this is the way we've got to go. Because we've got too many voices. We can't come to a consensus. Somebody's going to make this decision, and I'm going to be the guy, so I'm going to be the guy. It's a possible scenario. It's plausible. And, and the final con that I see about this collaborative effort is if there's too much deliberation, if there's too much debate, if there's too much info circling throughout the room, then it slows the process down. If you are waiting for all nine or ten people that showed up to Jaden Daniels Pro Day yesterday, if you are waiting for all nine of those guys to agree on the player, it might take longer to get there. And so as you're taking time to go through each and every player, if you take too much time because there's too many voices and there's too much back and forth, does that drag the process out and maybe you lose something on the back end because you were so stuck in having this debate and conversation about Drake May that you don't really feel like you had enough of a conversation on, for example, Bo Nix. So this is going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. People will tell you that Belichick was a one-man band, especially towards the tail end. They're going the polar opposite. There are pros and cons to that polar opposite. Now, I would much rather have the collaborative effort because I do believe you need pushback in that room. But the Patriots have to identify those cons and make sure that it is an efficient process and understand that not everybody is going to be 100% sold on every football player that they talk about. All right, like, subscribe, trying to hit 3,000 subscriptions by April 8th. We can do it. We can absolutely do that. We're about 250 away, but the only way that we can do that is if you continue to like this show and if you continue to tell people about the show, and if you haven't subscribed, what you waiting for? Make sure you subscribe and get notified. We need this room to get bigger, okay? We need this community to get bigger. Let's jump into a, a couple of chats here. Jai Sri Ram says, uh, Daniels was in college twice as long as May. His projection is much higher than Daniels. We want to draft a quarterback for 2030, not 2024. I agree with you. I agree with you. And somebody asked me, I think it was Rob D yesterday who asked me, would it be May or Daniels? And I said, May would be my pick because I, I believe right now, March 28th, I still stand by this. I stood by it yesterday. Drake May has more potential. He's younger. There's, you know, there's a year and a half, two years difference between these two guys. Now, of course, you could say, well, he's inexperienced and he's got, you know, some mechanic issues and he's got some foot issue, footwork issues and all those things. And, you don't really know what you can get from him. He's made some mistakes, blah, 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 blah. You have a more sure thing in Daniels. To me, if you're drafting a quarterback at three, you're going for the home run. You're not making the safe pick at three. There has to be inevitably a little bit of risk because you're swinging big. And that's my argument with the J.J. McCarthy thing. J.J. McCarthy to me, okay, he could absolutely be a starting quarterback at the NFL. He could end up being pretty damn good. 
But May has more high-end traits. He's got a better arm. He's got off-platform ability at a higher level than McCarthy does. And he was asked to do more at North Carolina. And that's, you know, no shot at McCarthy. It's just McCarthy was on a very good team. There were a number of games this year, for example, he did not even have to play in the fourth quarter because Michigan was just trouncing teams. Against Penn State when Jim Harbaugh was out, I watched that game with my buddies down in Virginia Beach. Michigan ran the football 32 straight times against Penn State. 32. So, Drake May, to me, he has the higher ceiling, and if you're picking at three, which they are, unless they trade down, then I'm taking the swing. Fritz says Drake May is the Zach Wilson of this class. I disagree. Uh, Zach Wilson had even less of a profile than Drake May. Uh, Drake May played in the ACC. While it's not the SEC, it's much better than the level of competition that Zach Wilson faced. Drake May's 2022 is his tape in 2022 and his season he put together when he had more talent, when he had Josh Downs, when he had an offensive coordinator uh, that really you know gelled with him better than this past season. He was tremendous in 2022. Zach Wilson was much smaller, smaller frame than Drake May. So I disagree with the Drake May, Zach Wilson thing. I think we fall into anybody who is a little rough around the edges and has that, again, th those some of those high-end traits we talk about. This Zach Wilson's arm was fantastic. But if you look at Drake May and his track record, his big-time throws at, from pro football focus – he leads this class in big-time throws. So there is tangible evidence there and tangible film that will show you Drake May can put it together and be that dude. But there are questions. But there's going to be questions about everybody. There's questions about Caleb Williams, about Daniels, about May, about McCarthy, about Bo Nix, about Michael. P there's going to be questions, folks. There's going to be questions about almost every single player, every single draft, every single year. There are not a lot of prospects that are flawless. There are not a lot of Andrew Lux walking around, okay? So there are going to be pros and cons to everybody. There's going to be some inherent risk when you draft third. Where are my entertainers? Daniels, May, JJ, Nix. So where are my entertainers? Has Jaden Daniels ranked above Drake May? Then he has McCarthy, then he has Nix. I, I would I would change May with Daniels, but I, I also want to make this clear. Again, I would be fine with Jaden Daniels being picked at three. Just because I like, just because I lean towards May over Daniels doesn't mean I don't think Daniels could be a, a really good quarterback in the league. He does have some of those elite traits, the athleticism, the deep ball that he throws, the placement. You know, so I don't want people to take this as I'm not a fan of, of Jaden Daniels. I just like May better. That's how I would say. Uh, Drago Arts FX says, unfortunately, pro days don't mean much. Look at Zach Wilson's pro day. Yeah, you, you can't put too much into it, right? There are some things that you can learn. Again, that's why I said the weight, the measurements, that was the most important part of the puzzle for Jaden Daniels yesterday. I, I did think he showed more zip on his throws. But the pro day is well below. It is below. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's a step in the process. If you feel good about a prospect and you're looking for one or two things, then it might, it might lead you to your ultimate conclusion. But the film is the film. You start with the film. Then you've got you know the pro day slash combine. Then you have these interviews, the Zooms, the top 30 visits. What does a guy do when he gets up on the whiteboard? the mentality of the player, you know, is he tough mentally? Is he a leader? Does he have certain intangibles? And that's why I know people go crazy over the word intangibles, but that's why we were asked yesterday, J.J. McCarthy, why has he got so much hype? Because the people who are talking to, to these reporters and these analysts, the people in the NFL that, that are pumping the tires of McCarthy, they love his intangibles. You could have all the physical skill in the world. You can have all the high-end traits in the world, but do you have it between the ears? 
And that's something that we don't know. And that's why it's difficult to ultimately say, this guy is no doubt surefire going to be a stud at the next level. That's why when I talk about Drake May, I say he has the potential to be that guy. But I have not had a personal interview with May. I have not sat down with him. I don't know what makes him tick. I don't know how good of a leader he is. I don't know how he is on the whiteboard. I don't know a lot of the things that these franchises know about these quarterbacks. And we will never know. So is there something missing? And so another part of the pro day is you walk around and you talk to the coaches, you talk to the teammates, and you try to gather information about the guy. You try to figure out his mentality. Drago, super chat. I appreciate you. $5 super chat. $5 will also get you in the door at the Patreon. Five bucks a month if you want to sign up. Patreon.com slash Nick Cattle, C-A-T-T-L-E-S. Exclusive content beyond this pod for you. May makes me nervous, but throwing across the field 55 yards with precision, velocity, and accuracy while in the air is inhuman. His ceiling is sky high. Yes. Look, there are plays. I forget who who tweeted it out, but I I uh, quote tweeted. If you want to follow me at Nick C Radio, where is it? Over here. That's it. At Nick C Radio, I, I quote tweeted a tweet going back several weeks ago, and it was a solid like three minutes of Drake May. And look, we can always fall in love with highlights. Don't fall in love with highlights. There there are highlights. There are lowlights. The idea of the highlights is what is this guy capable of? Can he do things that nobody else at his position can do? Or how many other people at his position can do those things? In that three-minute clip, whatever it was, of May, if you watch that clip, he is consistently under pressure. He's running around off-platform, and he is throwing dime after dime after dime. He's ripping it downfield. He's ripping it into the middle of the field. He's throwing through traffic. He's getting heat from a defensive lineman or a pass rusher, and he's escaping that pressure on the run, throwing across his body for 20, 25 yards, dropping it in the bucket. May has those kinds of plays on film where you look at it and you go, There ain't too many dudes that can do that. And so, yes, there are footwork issues and there are the mechanic issues and he's young and he missed some throws. He missed a number of throws last year at North Carolina when guys would be open. He wouldn't see him. He wouldn't make the play. Yes, he had some bad film or mediocre film against some pretty mediocre bad defenses last year. I think UVA was one of those games, if I remember correctly. He has some of that. Okay, there's no denying that. But you also look at some of the plays and you you realize this guy again, and it's not like he made only five of those throws. Number one in big time throws, according to Pro Football Focus, in this draft class. He made a lot of big time throws in North Carolina. And you think about that level of play, and you also understand, and this is not to knock Jaden Daniels again. I think Daniels will be a good to really good starting quarterback in the NFL as long as he stays healthy. But you also have to acknowledge that when you look at Caleb Williams and what he had offensively, and when you look at Daniels and what he had offensively, and you look at McCarthy and what he had, when you look at the top three or four quarterbacks in this draft, Drake May by far this past season had less than anybody else helping him. He had Tez Walker. Walker started the season late because the NCAA eligibility crap. So Tez Walker started the season later. The offensive line wasn't very good. And so he just didn't have a lot around him. When he had more around him in 2022, he lit the world on fire. People thought he was going to be the number one pick. It was either him or or Caleb Williams. That was the conversation. So all of that, I mean, I'm telling you, there are so many, as Conor McGregor would say, there are levels to this. There are so many levels to the decision-making process. That's why there are a lot of teams that swing and miss on quarterbacks. And I I think it's just a lazy conversation of, well, it's tough to find a quarterback in the top 10 because look at all the people in the top 10. There's just so much underneath that. And we don't want to pay attention to nuance or context 
We don't want to look at the full frame of everything. If you're Elliot Wolf, there's a checklist of about 100 things that you're running through to figure out if this guy is going to be the guy. And so what what's the situation that the guy gets drafted into, right? Was he rushed? Was he rushed as a prospect? Was he thrown right in because the owner wanted the guy to be thrown right in or the coach wanted him to be thrown right in? The offensive staff, the scheme, did it fit the player? Did he have a support system? Did he have a good offensive line? We could go on and on and on. How was he mentally? Was he a leader? Were there hiccups that the team missed? There's just a billion things. All right, let's close on this. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review. Five bucks a month for the Patreon exclusive content. Red Sox opening night. Got to talk about it for a couple of minutes. 10-10 first pitch. You excited for this one? (laughs) Are you going to make it to the first pitch tonight? Probably because the NCAA tournament's on, if, if you're into that, which I am very much into. Celtics play, so you might be up after the Celtics game. But 10-10 first pitch. Uh, just a few things. Look, you got Brian Bayo. This is his debut as the quote-unquote ace. I think he is more of a two than an ace. Maybe he'll surprise me. But this is by necessity. Giolito, done for the season. You had to slide somebody up to the one. You weren't going to sign Jordan Montgomery for whatever reason. So here he is, Bayo, the ace. We'll see how it goes. I am officially on Sedan Rafaela watch. He is going to be starting in center field for this team. I love it. He had a very, very good spring. He's an incredibly toolsy player. We know that. He's got power from the right side. He's got speed. He's got athleticism in the field. He could be one of the best outfielders in baseball within the next 18 months if he plays there full time. So I am officially on Rafaela watch. Tristan Casas, you know, what, what's he look like? Just Fabulous. Post All-Star break last year. How does he build off of that? Uh, I would be very disappointed if Casas doesn't end up with, you know, 30, 35 home runs this year. He is a high-level hitter, man. He is fantastic at the dish. So the Casas follow-up is something I'll be watching. Can Rafael Devers put it all together? Look, I I don't anticipate him ever being great in the field or even very good. He's going to have his issues at third base. We all Expect that to happen, but he's lowered his hands at the dish. Uh, He's been hitting more oppo shots in spring training. Hopefully that carries over to the regular season. You know, does this new approach at the plate make Devers even more dangerous? I hope so. So what kind of season will Devers put together? Trevor Story, hopefully he stays healthy. He got off to a slow start in spring training, but he mashed the last couple of weeks, and he is just a huge piece to this puzzle. If you tell me that Trevor Story is in this lineup for 140 games and he gives you 25 home runs and he gives you 25 steals and he gives you gold glove caliber defense, then I'm feeling pretty good. So can Trevor Story stay healthy? Because Devers and Story can help this team. Casas can help this team. They've got a pretty good lineup. They're thin on the right side. They're thin with right-handed power. There's no doubt about that. I would have brought back Justin Turner. I would have possibly... You know, brought back Adam Duvall, especially the contract that Duvall signed. But they are a little thin, right-handed power. So I I do think they have a good lineup. If they're healthy, they will hit. Their defense should be improved. Duran now in left. Yoshida to DH, that helps. Story, full-time, shortstop, that helps. Uh, Rafaela in center, that helps. Uh, What will Abreu look like full-time, right field, especially at Fenway? I think that's a question. Maybe you play Tyler O'Neill a little bit more out there, but their defense should be improved. Uh, their catching looked good. Connor Wong had a fantastic spring training, so their catching looks pretty stabilized. The bullpen, I think, is, is very solid. It's deep. The addition of Campbell, I like a lot. Slayton looked good. Uh, Jansen looks like he's healthy. Chris Martin looks like he's healthy. Maybe a little light from the left side, but their bullpen looks good. So I, I think their bullpen is deep in, in quality. Is at a high level there. The biggest question is the rotation. Biggest question. Again, I think Bayo's a two. He's going to be a one. Uh, I, I'm a little higher on Pavetta than some people. I do think Pavetta with that sweeper has found something. We saw that in the second half. I think Pavetta will be better. Uh, but there's questions. There's questions. Cutter Crawford uh, doesn't have the most electric stuff, but I think he can give you five, six innings every five days and, and do a pretty good job. Back end of the rotation, Hauk and Whitlock, two guys who have been better relievers and starters, 
Big question for me. I've got them with uh, 77 wins, let's say. Hopefully they surprise me. Hopefully. But I got the Red Sox at 77 wins. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, tomorrow, look, Drake May's pro day is today. Tomorrow we'll talk about Drake May and what we saw today. Uh, we'll also have a lot of other Patriots things to hit on. Celtics play tonight. Red Sox opening night. So we'll have enough to talk about tomorrow. Don't forget to give us that thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Trying to hit 3,000 by April 8th. You can help us out. So make sure you subscribe. Rate and review at Spotify and Apple Pods. Thanks to everybody who sent the Super Chats. And again, that Patreon page is for you. Exclusive content, five bucks a month. Go check it out. Patreon.com slash Nick Cattle. C-A-T-T-L-E-S. Back tomorrow, 11 a.m. I appreciate you.